So we've seen that the discrete time Fourier transform is a good tool for analyzing discrete time signals and systems. However, one thing that is not very good for is numerical computations. So one of the things we note with the transform itself is that it involves the sum over an infinite number of terms. So we cannot generally collect in practice an infinite number of samples of a signal. We cannot compute infinite sums. And even if we could, we wouldn't be able to store the result, which is a continuous time func or continuous function over these uh, normalized frequencies. So even if we use the property that is periodic, meaning that we only need to know it for one fundamental period, there is still an infinite number of normalized frequencies within this range, and we couldn't store it. So one could argue that these shortcomings are addressed by a very similarly named transform, namely the discrete Fourier transform. So the discrete Fourier transform is a transform that takes a set of n numbers, possibly complex valued, and map them into another sequence of n values with a formula which looks very similar to the discrete time Fourier transform. One can show that this transform is also unique, meaning that we have an inverse transform. So if we have computed this, then the inverse transform is simply given by a similar sum with a change in the sign of the exponential or conjugation over the transform coefficient, but in this case normalized by 1 over n. And the key thing to note and the different differentiating thing with the discrete time Fourier transform is in, in the discrete Fourier transform these sums only run over n capital N values which makes them computable in practice. The discrete time Fourier transform can be written more compactly as well using this notation w of n where w of n is simply an, the nth root of unity. So this is just the definition and instead of writing out the complex exponentials we can write the transform in terms of powers of this w of n coefficient. And this is often done in textbooks, and you will see this. One of the things we could use this, for instance, is to, in a short and compact way, show that the DFT is simply a linear transform between Euclidean spaces. So by that I mean if we take all the input samples x of 0 up to x of n, and you take the corresponding transform coefficient x, or capital X of 0 to capital X of n minus 1, then the mapping from x to x of n can be represented by this uh, linear transformation using the matrix W of n, where W of n simply contains these roots of unities and powers thereof. So we can use this, for instance, to show uh, what the inverse DFT has to be. So if the discrete Fourier transform is given by this linear mapping, then obviously the inverse has to be given then by the inverse mapping when we apply the inverse of this matrix times x of n. Right, and if you work out the mathematics, this is nothing else than the inverse formula for the DFT. So this will work out to be 1 over n times the conjugate of this matrix W of n times the vector of transform coefficients. The discrete time Fourier transform has many properties which are similar to those of the discrete time Fourier transform. So for instance, the property of linearity carries over just as we would expect. We also have Parseval's relation relating the energy in the time domain to the energy of the coefficients. Here there is an important difference in that we have a factor of 1 over n which appears in the transform domain. So the energy of the signal in the time domain is equal to 1 over n times the squared magnitude of the samples in the transform domain. But otherwise the relation is essentially the same. However, some properties are a little bit tougher for the DFT. So for instance, the time shift property doesn't have a clear analog for the DFT. And the reason for this is that what, would, what should we even mean by time shifting a signal which is only necessarily defined in the range 0 to n minus 1? Meaning that the transform only takes values from 0 to n minus 1. So if we would shift it in time, we would shift in new signals into the range considered by the transform. And these sig new signals or new values may not even be defined for the particular application that we look at. So in order to be able to answer what this time shift property or what the analog of that should be, let's consider a conceptual example first. So we start off by a signal x of n over the range 0 to n minus 1. We compute its discrete time Fourier transform. And as we saw previously, we can compute the inverse transform and get back at the signal x of n by simply computing this formula with a conjugation in the complex, ex complex exponentials. Right? So for n between 0 and n minus 1, this x tilde here should of course be equal to x of n due to the uniqueness of the transform. 
But now comes the question. We can always compute this for an arbitrary value of n, of course. But what should x tilde of n be if n is not within this range from 0 to n minus 1? And to make it a little bit more particular, let's consider the question, what would x of n be if we plug in capital N? So would it be equal the original signal x evaluated at n? Would it be equal to x evaluated at 0? Or would it simply be 0? So the correct answer is that x tilde of n is equal to x of 0, so option number 2. And this is part of a bigger result which we can see by considering the discrete Fourier transform as well as its inverse. So in particular, if we look at the complex exponential that appears in the inverse, we see that if we add an integer multiple of capital N to the time variable n, it doesn't actually change the value of the complex exponential. And this means that if we evaluate uh, the inverse formula for two time variables n, which are separated by an integer amount times capital N, we actually will get the same value back, which means that x tilde of n has to be a periodic function with a period equal to the number of samples that went into the D of t, namely capital N. And we've already seen that x tilde of n in the range when n is between 0 and n minus 1 must be equal to x of n. So x of n can be thought of as the periodic extension of this uh, set of numbers x of n. And we can write this in a more compact form using the modulo operator. So we would say that x tilde of n is equal to x of n modulo capital N. The same type of reasoning can be applied also to the DFT coefficients. So if you define x tilde of k as being the DFT formula evaluated at integers k not necessarily within this range 0 to n minus 1, and ask how does x tilde of k relate to x of k, we would find that x tilde of k is simply the periodic extension of x of k. So what we see by this is that both the sequence in time and the sequence in frequency can be thought of in two ways. So either we think of them as finite sequences with an index ranging from 0 to n minus 1, or we think of them as periodic sequences. And both of these uh, have some value on their own, but we will often not dif uh, differentiate them by using this tilde notation. So whenever we need to read outside of this sequence x of n, or read outside of this finite length sequence x of k, we'll think of the values that we pick up simply being the periodic extension of these values within this range, 0 to n minus 1. To summarize, we can think of the DFT as a transform taking a finite length sequence, for this particular example, a sequence of length 4, and mapping it to another finite length sequence, in this case a sequence of length 4, through the DFT transform and back again through the inverse transform. And this is the way that we'll typically use it when we do numerical computations. So we take these four values, we plug them into the formula, and we obtain another four values. But we could also think of it as a transform taking a periodic infinite length sequence and mapping it to another periodic infinite length sequence where the period is equal to the length of the original final length sequence that we had in the previous example. And in this particular case, it doesn't matter if we evaluate the transform itself and the inverse transform over this range of 0 to n minus 1, but we could evaluate them over an arbitrary uh, period. And this is a way which is sometimes helpful when we try to analyze and understand the properties of the discrete time Fourier transform. So in particular, if you go back to this uh, question that we had regarding the time shift, so how should we interpret the time shift? The answer is now almost obvious, that we should view the time shift not as a shift of this finite length sequence, but a shift of this periodic sequence, so, or a periodic shift of the finite length sequence. And this is what will map to a simple uh, multiplication with a complex exponential in the frequency domain, which we can also then express in terms of these w of n coefficients, if we wish. There's an interesting connection between the discrete Fourier transform and the Fourier series for continuous time functions as well. So if you remember, a continuous time periodic function x of t with a period length t can be represented by a sum of sinusoids which with frequencies that are multiples of the fundamental frequency 1 over t, where t is the period of time. Uh, and we need in general an infinite number of such sinusoids in order to build up the function x of t.
if you look at what the DFT states through the inverse transform is that a periodic sequence x of n with a period length n can be built uh, by some of the sinusoids with frequencies that are multiples of the fundamental period n of the fundamental frequency 1 over n uh, which is in the transform. So the 1 over n times the DFT coefficient plays the same role as this coefficient c of m in the Fourier series. There is one more important difference which is kind of interesting and that is that if you're working in discrete time as opposed to continuous time you only need a finite number of such sinusoids in order to represent an arbitrary uh, periodic uh, discrete time sequence x of n. So this cyclic nature of the discrete Fourier transform has some important and interesting properties. So if you remember for the discrete Fourier transform we had this property that if you take h of ni and x of ni, so two transform and multiply them together to get y of ni, the corresponding operation in the time domain was a convolution between the two sequences h of n and x of n. Uh, and this uh, we used to analyze linear filters or linear time invariant systems in general where we had this property that the output is given by the input convolved with the impulse response of the system. And we could look at that in the frequency domain saying that the Fourier transform of the input yields an output by multiplication with the frequency response of this system. So if we look at the corresponding result for the discrete Fourier transform, we have that if you take two transforms h of k and x of k and you multiply them together to get y of k, then the corresponding signal in time y of n will also be a convolution between the two sequences h of n and x of n but it will be a different type of convolution than the, that, than the one that we had for the discrete Fourier transform. So more particularly it will be a cyclic type of convolution. So you can view that as a convolution between these cyclic extensions of the sequences h and x, which, which we can also of course write using this module operation. And another difference here is that the sum will only run over capital N values. So this will have some important implications when we later in the course try to use the discrete Fourier transform in order to compute the output of a linear filter or a linear and time invariant system. So if we add these two properties to the list of properties we have for the discrete Fourier transform, we have the property that if a circular convolution in time corresponds to a multiplication in frequency, and we'll generally use this notation with an n in a circle in order to uh, denote the n point circular convolution since the convolution operation here depends on the length of the transforms that we use. Similarly we can look at uh, the case when we multiply in time in which case we will have a similar result saying that we get a convolution in frequency. However in that particular case we'll get one of these 1 over n factors in this result but otherwise it's quite similar. For sequences that are of finite length, we have a direct relation between the discrete time Fourier transform and the discrete Fourier transform. So if we assume that x of n here is a sequence which is defined for all n, so it's an infinite length sequence, but we assume that x of n is equal to 0 for negative n and n greater than or equal to capital N, meaning that x of n is non-zero only for capital N values. And we look at the discrete time Fourier transform of this sequence, well, by definition, the discrete time Fourier transform is given by this infinite sum, but since x of n is only non zero in the range 0 to n minus 1, it, the, the infinite sum reduces to a finite sum. And we can compare this finite sum to the definition of the discrete Fourier transform, which we have here. So if we rewrite this a little bit uh, into the following form, we see that the only thing which separates these two sums is the appearance of ni in one of them and this factor k over n in the other. So what this implies is that if you evaluate the kth component of the discrete Fourier transform, that's equivalent to evaluating the discrete time Fourier transform at this particular frequency k over n. So if you look at this graphically, what it implies is that if we have a sequence, in this case a sequence of length 4, and we uh, look at the discrete, Fourier, discrete time Fourier transform of that sequence, so x of ni, and in this particular case we plotted the absolute value of that transform the values that are computed by the discrete Fourier transform could be viewed as a sampling operation on this discrete time Fourier transform. So the value that, values that we would obtain would be this value, this value, this value, and this value. So in a sense, the discrete Fourier transform 
can be used to compute the discrete time Fourier transform numerically for sequences that are of finite length. So what we just saw uh, is that if we had a sequence of length 4, we could use a discrete time Fourier transform to compute certain values of the discrete time Fourier transform. So uh, what if we had uh, a sequence of length 4, but instead we wanted to know more of the values of the discrete time Fourier transform. So say we wanted all the frequencies separated by 1 over 8 in terms of normalized frequency. How would we use the discrete Fourier transform to compute those values instead? Would we take the sequence that we have, the four values, and repeat them in time, and then compute the 8-point DFT of this sequence? And here we use the arrow to indicate which entry in the sequence correspond to time 0. Or would we instead take the values that we have, x0 to x3, and repeat them? So we had x0, x0, x1, x1, and so on and then compute the discrete time Fourier transform of that. Or would we take the four values that we have, x0 to x3, and just append zeros to the end of this sequence and compute the 8-point DFT of that sequence? Or would we place these zeros in between samples? So we would have x0 followed by a zero, x1 followed by a zero, and so on. Well, the correct answer to the question is option number three. And we can see this by returning to the definition of the transform, which uh, is this infinite sum that reduced to a finite sum over only uh, four values in this case. However, uh, using the fact that x of n is zero outside of this range, which we would obtain by adding seven or four zeros to the end of the known four samples, we could equivalently write this as a sum from zero to 7. And this would of course then correspond to the 8-point DFT of the same sequence when we had the zeros inserted into the sequence. And that would allow us to obtain the frequencies at uh, sample values that are only 1 over 8 apart. So looking at that graphically, we return to the example where we had, which we had where we had the time, discrete time Fourier transform of a length 4 sequence. If we now append four zeros to that sequence and compute the eight-point DFT, what we would obtain is the samples spaced one over eight apart in terms of normalized frequency. So we would achieve or, or compute a double uh, number of samples. And in fact, this is the way that this plot is numerically generated. So since we cannot compute exactly, of course, the discrete time Fourier transform, the way to obtain this smooth curve for the plot or simply to take this length 4 sequence and in this particular case append enough zeros in order to make the se uh, sequence uh, 512 samples long. Uh, and that, uh, when plotted in a graph like this, is indistinguishable uh, from a continuous time function when we look at it. Summarize. Uh, the high-level view of the discrete Fourier transform is that it's a transform which takes a sequence of endpoints and maps it to another sequence of endpoints. And there are several interpretations of this mapping. So one is as a linear or orthogonal transform between two length n vectors, so we have finite length sequences. We could also view it as the equivalent of the Fourier series for periodic but discrete time sequences with a period time equal to length n. Or we could equivalently view it as a sampled version of the discrete Fourier transform computed for these lengths n sequences where we assume that the sequences are zero padded when uh, comparing to the discrete Fourier transform. And we saw that if you take two discrete Fourier transforms and you multiply them, that's equivalent to an endpoint cyclic convolution in time. Uh, and this is different from the regular convolution. And this will have some important implications later on when we use the discrete Fourier transform for filtering.